My hobby is philosophy. That might sound like a strange hobby, but thinking about the nature of our world and the answers to great broad questions is an inherently interesting pursuit. I'm going to assume you're familiar with Homestuck already and use it as a springboard to discuss philosophy. It's a unique springboard in this way, due to Homestuck's myriad stories and its absurd length, a great deal of diverse readings could be made of it. Today's topic is Hegel and his ideas of history as explored through Homestuck. Quick note, I say antithesis instead of antithesis in this video. This is for clarity's sake. It makes more sense to pronounce it this way to contrast it with thesis. If you think I'm wrong, then I'll show you where the close tab button is. Part 1. It's Hegelian dialectics. If you're looking for a succinct introduction to Hegel and a lecture upon which much of this video draws, look at Dr. Darren Staloff's video on Michael Segrew's channel entitled Hegel's Philosophy of History. This channel is indispensable and makes philosophical hobbyism a reality, accessible to any and all, a great springboard into broader topics. But let's introduce Hegel here, or at least introduce the relevant topic, dialectics. What is dialectics? To be clear, many inspired by Hegel had a version of dialectics, most notably Marx and Engels of communist fame, but Hegel's dialectic is very specific. Dialectics, or dialectical arguments, are formed when two competing theses, or ideas broadly, are pitted against one another. They are arbitrarily the thesis and antithesis, and Hegel is where the latter word reached common use. When a thesis and antithesis, both are arbitrary and interchangeable but necessarily related, come into conflict, they inevitably produce something new. Let's use an example. I might say the sky is blue. We'll call that the thesis. But you might disagree and say the sky is gray. We'll call that the antithesis. We have two seemingly mutually exclusive claims that need to be reconciled. This reconciliation is called synthesis. Usually, synthesis in Hegelian terms also implies conflict as a simple as an argument or as complex and deadly as war. In this case, we may argue for a while, but discover that sometimes the sky is blue and sometimes the sky is gray, where there are many clouds. The key here is that these ideas at first glance seem contradictory, but through synthesis achieve a more complete picture of reality, of truth. Another key is that both arguments, thesis and antithesis, are necessarily changed by coming in conflict, forming a new thesis. This thesis then, in turn, can encounter more antitheses. For example, what about when we say the sky is pink, or when the sky is green? By resynthesizing theses, Hegel presumes that we can reach towards truth about any given observation. Learning more about this involves topics like syllogism and phenomenology, but those aren't for this video. Dialectics might seem straightforward at first, but Hegel used this process to demonstrate how human history was shaped. Instead of a simple scientific thesis, let's take a more ephemeral, more sociological thesis, two hypothetical political parties. One party, let's call them A, has the belief that society can be made better with a decrease in freedom and an increase in social programs. Another party, B, has the belief that society can be made better with an increase in personal freedom and a decrease in social programs. While these two parties might seem opposed, neither one is false in a Hegelian sense. More freedom works for some people, and more social programs works for others. The synthesis, then, is that the ideals of personal freedom and social good are not mutually exclusive, and individuality can be preserved while still adhering to a greater social whole. The real issue plaguing parties A and B are an overclass of rich elites who run the entire process, thereby immiserating the vast majority of people to... to, uh... Oh, I'm sorry. I said a hypothetical example, not a real one. <clears throat> you get the idea, though. By exploring a supposed inconsistency between two statements, you can reach a greater truth. I like to think of it as cross-examining reality. Dialectics can, and has been, applied broadly, but let's explore a literary dialectic in Homestuck. Part 2. The War-Weary Villain the synthesis of theses is so often revolution. 
There are essentially two purposes for dialectics. The first is analysis, either historical or smaller in scale. This is what Hegel's main historiography was about. The second purpose is logic and prediction, or trying to reconcile existing contradictions. This was the project of Marx and Engels. In the case of the mayor from Homestuck, the former analytical method is necessary. Prospet and Durst of the medium offer us a very classical example of thesis and antithesis. Prospet, the good guys. Durst, the bad guys. But with a closer look, things aren't what they seem. What truly separates these chess guys besides color? They are all born of ectolabs and distant meteors. They, in some way, share a womb. It's only in Skya's endless warfare that they are pitted against one another. This is the synthesis that our were-weary villain exposes in his uprising. Black and white walking together, fighting against their true oppressor, the kings. Again, we see this theme of overclass oppressing two supposedly opposed underclasses. The best part of W.V.'s uprising is that it would seem, without interference from Jack Noir, he would have succeeded, but the crazed demon simply obliterated his forces. This is the tragedy of the mayor. It is the reverse of Deus Ex Machina, Demonium Ex Machina, Jack Noir. What I find striking about W.V.'s uprising is how similar it is to revolutions of the past in real life. He's a charismatic, somewhat reluctant hero, striking out against his oppressors on his own terms, setting aside the aesthetic for a greater purpose. Most dialectics in the modern era are in some way muddied. For instance, I mentioned earlier how we ourselves are engaged in a dialectic similar to Durst and Prospit. We see ourselves, our side, as good and the other side as bad. We observe this, for instance, when a state that normally votes red, getting plowed by some natural disaster, Kentucky floods and Texas snowstorms, and posters online delight in the destruction of what they see as hotbeds of evil in the world. Or we see this in the myriad videos on YouTube professing to depict a charismatic conservative, quote, destroying liberals. We are distracted by the trappings of our division such that we cannot recognize solidarity with people we have much in common with. Ask any man what he thinks of Bill Gates, and unless there's some bootlicking liberal or some business-worshipping libertarian, they will respond with utter derision. Remember the time that Microsoft outspent the IRS in court to evade their taxes? You should Google it. Our enemies are not rednecks or SJWs. They are the smiling, grinning politicians in positions of power. They are the businessmen who rig the game once they've won it. We all know this across political divides. But the issue is... We are divided and compartmentalized by our own social preferences. We have to overcome this to get anywhere, otherwise our time is spent fighting with each other. The reconciliation, the synthesis between our states, is populism. But populism is hard. As mentioned before, we're divided by deep-rooted ideologies. Asking someone to set these aside is a towering order, and it doesn't feel good to desire camaraderie with someone who would just as soon spit on you. I don't foresee our world being reconciled and synthesized like the mayor's revolution on Skya. There are too many divisions that exist that run so much deeper than simple color and aesthetic. The true genius of the overclass in our modern age is not that they have constructed an illusory battleground which we are trapped inside of, but the battleground that they've constructed to distract us from their exploitation is in fact real and deadly. Kind of like Hunger Games. Huh. Anyway, that was pretty fucking pretentious of me to compare Homestuck to our own material reality like that. I'm not even particularly Hegelian in my own thinking, so take this section with a great big grain of salt. If I was accidentally insightful, then take that away with you. But if not, there you go. Part 3. What's Dirk's deal? Dirk and Vriska seem to be the eternal subjects of my videos. Of all the guys in Homestuck, they're the most substantiated, the most interesting to seek the teeth into vis-a-vis -vis philosophy. Dirk and Hegel, however, go together unnaturally well. Hegelian philosophy and Dirk share this outward franticness guised by their own seeming calmness. Hegel undertakes the monumental task of defining all of history, whereas Dirk's intricate plots and schemes prove to defy planning. They are men who bit off more than they could chew. Dirk is also a man plagued by antithesis, literally. He is a man with walking, talking antitheses in the form of his splinters. 
Something that Dirk never ultimately finds, even in the extended post-canon work, is himself, even though himself is someone who's within arm's length. It's his unique blind spot. Dirk sees too much of others in himself, like Dave's bro or his autoresponder, and this causes him to wallow miserably in the unsynthesized truth of himself. If we could sidestep into psychology for a moment, there's actually a name for living with unresolved tension from contradiction. It's cognitive dissonance. Dirk cannot resolve this tension because there is an upside to never having to deal with himself as he is. He never has to answer the question of, is he a good person? The ultimate tragedy, then, is that he will never see that the answer is yes. Part 4. Vriska Vriska is also someone who must reconcile her inconsistencies. In Act 6, we see two versions of Vriska. The Vriska who experienced death and betrayal, and the Vriska who had her existence affirmed. Neither of Vriska seems happy here. The former is in a failing relationship with Mina, and the latter is a petulant child, even calling parenthesis Vriska fat like some mean girl in high school. Both Vriskas are fucking pathetic, but we know Vriska, both versions, to do incredible things, from finding the house juju to literally defeating Lord English. How do we reconcile this? How does Vriska reconcile this? Essentially, Vriska experiences a double synthesis, because both of herselves go on to reach higher understanding after the confrontation with their e each other. I'm sorry if that sentence didn't make any sense. One Vriska affirms her narrative relevance and goes on to date Mina for a bit, raise an army, and defeat the big bad. The other retreats into obscurity with her ex-girlfriend and old flame, Terezi. Both syntheses get to the heart of Vriska. She is a woman dangling on the razor's edge. She is either a plot-relevant badass main character, or she is a self-actualized loving person. Both are impossible, and one must be chosen. It doesn't matter which. Through her, and through Dirk before, we see the dangers in not reconciling theses. It becomes monstrously dangerous and actively tears apart logic. It becomes a place where thought can't exist. Deadlock. At least Vriska got out of it. Part 5. Hegelian Critique in Homestuck Personally, I think that dialectics can be incomplete. Not everything can be solved with synthesis, nor should everything be solved with it. Synthesis and dialectics can be a potent force of good when utilized between conflicting and true statements, but there's a pitfall that can trap the mind when dealing with theses that are not inherently authentic. Let's call this bad faith dialectics, where an untruth is posited as a thesis. Going back to the beginning, my example of the blue sky dialectic. Some madman might posit, in either bad faith or insanity, that the sky is in fact chartreuse at all times, and any contrary statement is false. If we employ synthesis here, it becomes impossible. Not only are our conclusions about the sky and this thesis contradictory, but they are mutually exclusive. There is no synthesis to be reached. It must be discarded. Two examples of this from Homestuck are the main villains, Jack Noir and Lord English. If we approach these villains from a dialectical angle, we might expect that they should be bargained with, or that their ideology might in some way be incorporated to gain their cooperation. There's nothing to be gained here, and dialectic fails us. In the case of Lord English, if he is not singularly eradicated, the entirety of all universes will cease to be. There's no Hegelian solution here. Some might say that such conflicts were never Hegel's intent, but we can get into that if we discuss his historiography, so more on that later. Others might argue that the solution is still Hegelian, but in a different way. In times when a thesis must be defeated outright, one might posit that the synthesis still, still occurs when the thesis is changed to combat the antithesis. I don't buy this because it stretches the idea of synthesis being a cooperative conclusion. Dialectics can be a potent tool, but ultimately in real life it has mostly failed to bear any fruit as anything but a history analyzing tool. It's not all encompassing as Hegel would like it to be. It can seem almost liberal, a notion that at the core of any argument is a kernel of truth when in reality there are some arguments that don't warrant discussion. Part 6. End. Whatever the shortcomings or applications of dialectics, its most potent use in my mind is not philosophical whatsoever, but actually literary. Think about it. 
Most stories feature a protagonist in conflict with some force. We can imagine the hero as our thesis and the villain as the antithesis. Such dynamic duos as Harry and Voldemort, Batman and the Joker, and of course, Wily e. Coyote and the Roadrunner. Ultimately, Hegel strikes me as a somewhat mystical figure. He undertook a massive task in trying to make the world fit his model of dialectics, and in spite of clear and obvious shortcomings, he is hailed as one of the most influential thinkers of our time. Hegel is not a magical wizard of anthropology who invented history. He is a historian philosopher who came up with some good ideas. Calling Hegel overrated would brand me as a Philistine because his ideas are still resonant, but they should be tempered with skepticism and used as one approach of many. In these essays, I try to add something actionable to your life. So here's today's item. In your own life, find something contradictory. It shouldn't be hard. Maybe you promise yourself that you're going to wake up at 7 and you don't. Maybe you can't get yourself to work out even though that you should. Find the contradiction between what you want and the reason you're not doing it and discover a compromise between them. As an example, recently I noticed that I get distracted on social media while working. Thesis. I need to work on projects. Antithesis. I get distracted working on projects. The synthesis for me then was twofold to turn off all notifications, especially Twitter, and to set a timer for an hour while working so I can take breaks and not go insane and get bored. The synthesis, you'll notice, includes both indulging the urge to check social media while also cutting it out. It's a more truthful, honest relationship with the way I interact with the internet that still accepts a limitation in myself. Maybe you can find something like this too in your life. I bet you won't have to look far for a contradiction like this. This has been Funk McLovin with more Homestuck philosophy. If you like what I do, sign up for my Patreon to get access to some unscripted podcast-style episodes on topics like Rosemary and Caliborn. Thank you.